Okay, sisters and brothers in the English ministry, peace be with you. Uh, I was here last week, officially new for the very first time. So I spent some time introducing myself in the sermon. And I'm very glad that uh, when I introduced myself in the sermon, I also received some echoes from, from among you. Some people come to me after the service and say, oh, I feel the same way when you share something about your life. And some people even say, since you share so many things about yourself, I feel that I also want to share something about myself to you. <laughs> I want to make, make, make it equal. Yeah. So since I'm new here, you know, uh, I think newcomers feel this way. Everything is new. Everything looks really great. And so the, the handbell team, wow, the, the music sounds really wonderful. The praise team is very energetic, praying, praising the Lord. Everything is so nice. I, I also hope that this kind of feeling can stay with me uh, even after many years uh, in the English ministry. I can still feel fresh and uh, new uh, each and every day, uh, praising our Lord. So during this past week, so it was my first, second week in the English ministry, so some people come to me and introduce themselves to me, either privately or some people even surprised me. Because last week I announced my office hours. Yeah, so some, somebody also come to my office hours and just uh, without noticing me uh, ahead of time, just appears there and then say, hi, Pastor Lian. So who am I? <laughs> some people gave me a quiz. So, who do you say I am? <laughs> do you remember me? Uh, I'm, I'm your congregation. I belong to the English ministry. Uh, I said, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have so many people that I need to remember in this short while. So about 100 people or so that I need to remember the names. So please still like these people in the past week. So come to me, introduce <laughs> yourself to me, and please allow me to to, to misremember or not remember your name and what you are up to for a while. Allow me to get used to this place and allow me to uh, uh, become one family together with you. Yeah. So uh, this week, uh, we actually also uh, encountered in the gospel story, a story in continuation huh, from the last week. So it's a continuation of the gospel story from from last week. Yeah. So last week we talked about Jesus on this journey together with the disciples. So I titled my sermon series from last week on uh, until a few weeks later. It will always be entitled On the Road with Jesus. Yeah. Last week I put the verse number wrong. So it should begin in Luke chapter 9 verse 51. Uh, at that time, time approach for Jesus, so he resolutely set out for Jerusalem, all the way until chapter 19, when Jesus finally reached Jerusalem. So this week's sermon is also in continuation from last week. But we, in this week's sermon, I don't know if you are familiar with this story, but in this week's uh, gospel story, we are reminded very acutely that even among a faith community like this, so in the EM English ministry community, I don't know if you know each and every one of you in your seats. You know, one of my uh, new experiences coming to the English ministry is coming to a really big church. So my previous church was a very, very small, tiny congregation of usually around 20 to 30 people worshiping at the time. So I can remember each and every person's name. I can know everybody who is not here <laughs> for the week. So I don't even need a list to, to you know, name check everybody. So I can just look down and I know everybody's favorite seats. I know you all have your favorite seats as well in the English ministry. So people tend to sit in the, in the places they are familiar with. And people also tend not to move around too much, you know. So maybe next time, because I'm new here, maybe next time I encourage you to try. You know, you are always sitting at the right-hand side, right-hand lane in the front. Maybe next time you can switch to the back. <laughs> and maybe people in the back, you can also switch to the front. Yeah. This kind of uh, 
switching positions uh, or moving around is very important, as the gospel story today also shows. Uh, the, the gospel story Jesus told us today is a very vivid story. Yeah. We are told about a, a story of a rich man and a beggar. And you, are, you might be familiar with this story. So there is a, a man who is very rich. And at his gate, <laughs> there is a beggar. So the rich man most probably knows the existence of that beggar. And the rich man probably knows that he is there, he is around. So maybe also a little bit like uh, sisters and brothers in the English ministry. We are aware that there are people sitting at the back. We are aware that people are, are here and there. But we may not know exactly what they are up to, what their worries are about, what, what their stories are. How can we share, share this life together? So I talked about the difference between a big church and a small church. Actually, no matter how big the small church, uh, how big the church is or how small the church is, we actually have the same issue. That issue is the issue of sharing lives together, sharing this fellowship or sharing this communion in Christ together. So even if we are worshiping together in this building, we may not know exactly each and every person. I think Jesus' story today is a, a reminder and also a challenge for us to really noticing who is sitting at the gate, who is sitting at the table, who is inside the gate, and who is out. So a little bit about the background of the story. Okay, so Luke actually has a, 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 a logic going all the way from chapter 15 all the way to chapter 16. Yeah. When we are reading the gospel stories, I already told you that we need to be aware of where exactly that story uh, exists in the a bigger picture, in the longer storyline of the gospel. So actually, if you are reading chapter 16, you can go at least a little bit back to chapter 15 to find out why Jesus is telling these stories who Jesus is telling these stories to. So may we begin in chapter 15. Yeah. So in chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, yeah. actually all the stories, yeah, all the parables that we love in chapter 15 and 16 comes from this little tiny beginning. Yeah. Chapter 15, verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So around Jesus, there are all these tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus likes to welcome all these different kinds of uh, people regarded by the society as not welcome. They are, they are sinners. They are tax collectors. People do not like them. But Jesus likes to get around and together with them. But there is also another group of people uh, traveling together with Jesus Christ. So you can imagine Jesus is on the way together with the disciples. And together with the disciples, there are tax collectors, there are sinners. On the other hand, there are also Pharisees and teachers of the law, also spying on Jesus, also, also joining in the whole bunch. So it's also a little bit like our church group. We are not all the same. Yeah. We have different kinds of agendas. We have different kinds of cares. We are in different walks of life. But we are all together traveling and uh, journeying together with Jesus Christ. So Jesus likes to eat together with tax collectors and sinners. But on the other hand, Pharisees and teachers of, of the law, they are muttering behind the back. Uh, I, I really like this, this, this quote. If you want to remember one verse, I think this is a verse to, to remember. Uh, this verse says, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Yeah. So who, who are these Pharisees and, and teachers of the law talking about? Yeah. They are talking about our Jesus. <laughs> they are talking about the Jesus we love. So who is this kind of Jesus that we love? The Jesus we love is actually the, this man <laughs> welcomes sinners and eats with them. Yeah. So, some people say, oh, Jesus likes to, to eat, so very Taiwanese. <laughs> we like to, to have a meal. 
And, but notice especially who Jesus is eating with. So Jesus especially welcomes sinners and eats with them. So it is actually under this background that Jesus welcomes and eats together with these sinners and collect tax collectors. And there is another group of people who does not like to see this happen. They are muttering and they don't, do not agree with this situation. It is under this kind of background that all of the stories follow. So what are all of those stories? Yeah. Those stories we are very familiar with. So the story of the lost sheep. So there are 100 sheep and a person lost one sheep. And the lost coin. So there are 10 coins and that person lost, that woman lost one coin. And also there are two sons. So one lost and found and the other almost going to be lost. Yeah. So it is actually under this situation that Jesus are talking about these parables. Uh, under the situation when, they are, when he is under attack by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And while Jesus is traveling together with the disciples, telling them how important it is that we need to welcome these kind of outcasts. So if we go on to chapter 16, also verse 1. So this is the beginning of our passage last week. So Jesus turns from telling the, the parables to the Pharisees and the disciples, uh, Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus turns the attention to the disciples. So chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus told his disciples this parable of the rich man and his manager. So the story from last week is actually addressed to Jesus' disciples. So after last week's story ends in uh, verse 13, chapter 16, verse 14 goes on to say, The Pharisees who loved money heard all these and were sneering at Jesus. And then he said to them. Yeah. So you see, Jesus welcoming tax collectors and sinners. Uh, the Pharisees disagrees with him. So Jesus tell, told them three parables. And then Jesus turns to the disciples, tell them one parable. And the Pharisees are still muttering, so Jesus turns back, turns back again to address these Pharisees who loved money and heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them. So usually in our Bible, there are a few verses in between last week's parable and today's parable that in our Bibles we sometimes uh, call them, we give them the title, Additional Teachings. Because Bible readers have usually found it very difficult connecting these additional teachings with the parable before it and also with the parable after it. However, I would like to argue that these additional teachings in the middle, so verses 15 all the way until verses 18, is actually the key to understand both the previous parable about God and money that we talked about last week, and also this coming parable about the rich man and the beggar. So what are these additional teachings about? Verse 15, Jesus addresses these Pharisees. So you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Jesus is addressing the love of money of these Pharisees. So now we are aware of one very intriguing situation. Yeah. I don't know what people are expecting from pastors. You now one of my experiences working in the General Assembly beforehand, so before I come to the Shanglian English ministry, was that in the General Assembly, you know, pastors have a very high, high position. <laughs> you know, people maybe out of their respect for pastors, maybe out of their love for God's teaching, they usually pay a lot of respect to pastors. So in the General of Assembly office, if you are a pastor, you are almost like the privileged person <laughs> in the whole building. So there are other people working under you and helping you, and they are all give you very much respect. However, what people are 
expecting from these uh, religious leaders. Uh, people re expect these religious leaders to be their spiritual leader, uh, to bring Jesus' teaching to them. Uh, however, it is also very common that religious leaders uh, become a little bit like the Pharisees in the story. Uh, they become also lovers of money at the same time. It is very easy, uh, even in faith communities, that we uh, unaware of, unaware, uh, we, we sometimes value uh, those people who have money and status, and we treat them as if it is the blessedness, it is the, the, the exhibition of blessedness from God. So even in faith communities, we see this situation. But Jesus makes it very clear. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Jesus has a, another idea about God and money, as we talked about uh, last week. In verse 17, it says, It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the last stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. When people see this verse, they usually scratch their heads and they say, what is this has anything to do about the, the teaching prior? And what does that have to do with the teaching after? Yeah. We will find out very soon. And in verse 18, another more confusing verse. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And a man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, why is Jesus suddenly switching from talking about money to talking about marriage and commitment? Yeah. I think many people regard these as additional teachings uh, that is just tucked into these, these parables as unrelated to the parables. However, I read them actually as an integral part. I think Jesus continues to stress that their faithfulness to God's law and faithfulness to your wife, and faithfulness to the law, faithfulness to God's commandment to love the neighbor and to love the poor, is all together in one package. So these are not additional teachings. These are actually the key to understand God's consistent teaching all the way from the beginning of the chapter 16 until our story today. So let us go into our story for today. As I talked that there, there, are, um, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So yesterday in the praise team, we were deciding our dress code and they finally decided that their dress code for today will be deep blue. <laughs> and after I go home, I, I, I looked at my little baby Actually, my baby was wrapped in purple cloths. And so I said, oh, this is the rich man in my home. <laughs> so the rich man in my home is my son, <laughs> who is wrapped all the way in, 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 in purple cloths. So at that time, purple is the precious color. So purple uh, symbolizes people who are very rich. So in this parable that Jesus talks, he talks about two characters that are completely in extremes. Yeah. They are totally different. I don't know wh which character we identify more easily with. Do we identify more easily with the rich man? Or do we identify ourselves more easily with the beggar? Huh. I don't know if it is easy to, uh, to I identify with which. But in this world, there is a sharp contrast between this rich man who was dressed very well and lived in luxury every day, and prob probably eating sumptuously. And at his gate, so that means very, very close, huh? very, very nearby, huh? actually just right by at his gate. So he's certainly aware of it. He probably turned a blind eye, eye on him. He probably thinks to himself, well, I'm not in that kind of position to solve this problem of the the structure of the society, etc. At his gate was laid a beggar, and this beggar has a name. Yeah. This beggar is named Lazarus. Yeah. If you are aware that in all of Jesus' parables, there's none 
none, no characters in all of Jesus' parables who has a name. Uh, this is the only person in all of Jesus' parables which has a name. And this beggar is named Lazarus. Yeah. He was covered with sores, and he was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Yeah. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So this is the uh, depiction in a Jewish tradition. He is not just very poor, but he is also unclean because he is in touch with the dogs. So we are presented with uh, the depiction of these two characters who are on the extreme. So I don't know which one we will identify ourselves with more easily. However, there is a sharp turn in the story. Yeah. The, the time came. Yeah. You know, uh, in the beginning of the gospel, we always hear about uh, John the Baptist preach. John the Baptist always say, the time has came, uh, the time has arrived. Yeah, it is time, uh, so we need to repent and follow Christ, etc. In the story, the time has come. And what time it is? <laughs> it is the time of death. So the time has come that both the, the, the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And so this is a, 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 a story scholars usually say. This is a story you can find similar versions in Egyptian tales. However, Jesus twists it with a very Jewish scent. Yeah. Jesus puts this dead beggar in Abraham's bosom, in Abraham's arms. So the time came, the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The, the rich man also died and was buried. And he ends up in Hades, so in the place where, where there's only darkness, where it is, uh, 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 um, uh, is down there huh, in, in a Jewish thought, huh, in Hades, where he was in torment. And he looked up and saw Abraham far away. So in the lifetime, the beggar was just at the gate. Uh, the, the rich man can see him, although he did not recognize him. He does not acknowledge him. He does not approach him. Yeah. He does not come close to the, the beggar in any way. However, now in Hades, he can see Abraham, but now it's far away. Yeah. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Yeah. So this uh, death brings a very dramatic uh, reversal. Yeah. So everything was turned upside down. Yeah. Actually, since the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we are expecting that Jesus' coming brings this great reversal to everything in the society. So verse 24, he called to him, Father Abraham. Yeah. So this rich man, this rich person, he is Abraham's uh, a, a child. So he is an Israelite. And the beggar is also Abraham's child. The beggar is also an Israelite. So he called to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. So even though there is a great reversal of everything, so rich become poor, so who sits on the table becomes down there in the Hades, and who is, was on the, at the gate was now at the bosom of uh, Abraham's embrace. So even though there, there is a great reversal of almost everything, there is one thing that does not change, that is that rich man's attitude towards a relationship, uh, that rich man's relationship with the beggar. Yeah. He probably still thinks that he can command, he can ask the beggar uh, to, do, to do things. Yeah. He is so used to uh, asking people to do things for him. Yeah. He's already used to that kind of uh, behavior, that kind of re relationship was set in place. And so he asked Abraham, say, send Lazarus huh, to dip the pit of, pit, tip of the finger in water and cool my tongue. But Abraham replied, son, 
So Abraham still recognized that he is his son. He is Father Abraham. Abraham replied from far away. Yeah, so although there is a, a huge dis distance, somehow they can still hear each other. <laughs> they can still have a dialogue. That's very interesting. Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Yeah. So after this, uh, there is this great reversal of everything. And there is also a chasm separating. So you are no longer free to move upwards or downwards. So Abraham told this rich man this reality. Verse 27, yeah. then he suddenly becomes, he suddenly begins to show some kind of compassion. Yeah. So in verse 27, uh, we, it's the first time that we notice that this rich person uh, shows some kind of compassion. Yeah. He thinks of his family. <laughs> and so he said, he answered, then, so if, even if I cannot cross over anymore, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus. Uh, so still no change. So this rich man is still asking and commanding Lazarus to do this and that. Father, send Lazarus to my family, maybe. Yeah. Let him, uh, for I have five brothers, uh, let him warn them uh, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Yeah. So this is the first sign of this rich person concerning for others. However, only within blood relatives. So only within family members. Yeah. There's one thing we need to note. So in here it says five brothers. So probably he has several sisters. <laughs> that is not included in, in the narrative. But he only concerns about the five brothers. Verse 29, Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Yeah. Here we begin to see, uh, do you remember in those additional teachings beforehand, uh, Jesus said, not a stroke in the law will be changed. And so this story is actually in line huh, with that saying. So that saying is not unrelated. Abraham replied, actually everything is already there. Everything is already in the book of Moses and the prophets. So even for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they are also reading the same Bible. Huh. They are also reading the same law and the prophets. So the, the Moses and Moses and the prophets basically means the Old Testament. So the Old Testament law and those prophets. Abraham stressed that God's message is consistent from the ancient times. In Moses and the prophets, it is already very clear. Yeah. It, it is, uh, I don't know if you are aware that God has a, a, a strong sense of uh, justice. <laughs> Our God really loves justice. He cares for the poor. So even in the, the Old Testament, God continues to ask the Israelites that you need to care for the poor among you. Yeah. Sometimes people will ask, so what does this rich person do wrong? Yeah. Did he commit any sin? Yeah. Did he break any law? Yeah. In our worldly view, yeah, he does not break any law. Yeah. But if we look at, look at it from our faith perspective, we will know that God commands justice and God asks people to care for each other and care for the needy. In that kind of way, sin exceeds our society's expectation of not breaking the law. Verse 30. <clears throat> The rich man continues to disagree with the father Abraham. So, you know, this rich person likes to argue <laughs> with, the, with father Abraham. He said, no, father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Yeah. It is a little bit interesting to think about this in more detail. So the beggar, the Lazarus, if the, the beggar comes back to life again, 
and goes to the rich man's brothers, do you think the brothers will believe the beggar? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the rich man's brothers probably are also very rich, and they also think, oh, this is the beggar at the, the gate of Lazarus. They will not even listen to them. Yeah. So from this story, we can, we can also draw a slight conclusion that God may be speaking to us through those people at our gates. Yeah. God may be speaking through to us with those people that we already almost exclude from our attention and we are blinded, not able to see. Verse 31, Father Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So I think uh, it is a, a, an interesting a bit of detail. Uh, if we are aware that Jesus, Jesus is, is the person who rises from the dead, right? So of course now it's still during Jesus' lifetime yeah, when he tells this story. But in retrospect, the disciples began to know that Jesus is the Christ through his resurrection. So Jesus is actually the, the person who rises from the dead and standing and talking towards them. So Jesus is as, as if it, Jesus is, is saying that you should, you should trust my word. Uh, you should follow my command. Uh, I am the person who rises from the dead. I am the person who fulfills uh, the, the Moses and the prophets. Yeah. So even at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we are, we are already aware of this great reversal. So in verse chapter 1, verses 50 to 51 to 53. Uh, it is a famous song during Christmas time. We are aware that in Mary's song, he already sang of Jesus' work of reversing everything and turning everything upside down. Yeah. In Mary's song, uh, Jesus, uh, Mary already praised God by saying, He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lift, lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And continue on in uh, chapter 6, we also are already familiar with uh, Luke's version of the Beatitude. Luke does not end only with blessed are those who blah, blah, blah. But Luke completely reverses everything by saying, but woe to those who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. And so we are already familiar with this great reversal in the Gospel of Luke. So I think with every parable, yeah. we can uh, dig always deeper by looking at every single characters in the parable. So I talked about that there is the rich man and there is a beggar named Lazarus. There are actually also dogs, angels, Abraham. There are the family, five brothers, and there are Moses and the prophets. Yeah. So my question is, who do you think we can identify ourselves more closely? Yeah. I think actually the story, uh, we usually stop in the front. But actually the story continues to the end with the Abraham part because actually we are in the place of those five brothers. And so if, 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 we, if uh, we died, then there is not, no movement anymore. The, the chasm has been set, as the story said. But we are actually in the place of those five brothers of the rich men. And we are still alive and we are there to decide if we want to turn a blind eye on the things that is actually happening and going around, around us. And we are also those five brothers who can decide. If we want to, to listen to the great and the wonderful, so people rising from the dead, or if we want to listen carefully to Moses and the prophets, the will of God that is so clearly and so, 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 so uh, clearly presented to us in the Bible already. I think this story also challenges us as a Bible reader. We need to decide if our readings of the Bible 
are in line of the Pharisees. So we read the Bible and we, we still love money and we still think that we can pursue a, a life of success like the Pharisees do. Or we need to choose our reading of the Bible in line with Jesus' reading. Uh, acknowledging that God loves justice and acknowledging that we need to get involved in each other's life and care for the needy. And there are many things, uh, so there are characters in the Bible, and there are also many things that we can o always pay attention to in the parable. So there are the purple cloths, the fine linen, there's the gate, there are the swords on the, on the person, there's a table, and there are food on the table, there's Hades, or there's the tip of, of the finger, water, tongue, or fire. So there are many different things in the parable that we can also pay attention to. And in the parable, there are also many contrasts. So a rich man and a beggar, inside the gate or outside the gate, on the table or fell from the table. In your lifetime, or the time came, beggar at his gate, or Abraham far away, there is a chasm in between, things that is set in place, or things that can still move, so someone from the dead, beggar at Abraham's side, or rich man in Hades, good things and bad things. Uh, there are lots of rich contrasts in the, in the parable that we can pay attention to. So my final question, and I think this is the question that this parable presents to all of us. So who is actually at our gate? No matter if we are rich or if we are not rich, yeah, it is very easy for us to not noticing things around. Yeah, so I, I mentioned that because I'm new here, I tend to be able to notice everything differently. But I can imagine after a few years here, or maybe I'm also going to become blinded by the things that usually happens, uh, things, people that usually sit at this place, uh, people who usually do this and that, there might be one point uh, that we are blinded as well. Uh, so it is always important, I think the, the, the gospel story reminds us, to, to really look hard at the detailed things around us, uh, to, to really look like, to really reflect that we might not be like the rich man, although the beggar is at the gate, but we never notice it, and we do not approach them, and we do not take any action uh, to reach them and establish a relationship with them. So who is at our gates, and are we blinded and not to see them? And on the other hand, we can also notice what is on our table. Yeah. So the rich man has food and riches, on his table. We can also look at what is on our, on our table today. What are the resources and the wealth that we have that we can share with those people who need those things? And finally, and I think, I think it's also one of the most important questions, that is how do we read or listen to the law and the prophets? I think God's commandments, as, as Jesus' parable showed us, is clear and has not changed. Yeah, it is not like Jesus comes and, and brings a completely new set of rules. Yeah, Jesus continues to say he is consistent with the God in the Old Testament. He just fulfills, yeah, he just reads differently from the Pharisees. So it is also very important for us to learn to read the Bible like Jesus to really listen to the law and the prophets. I think one of the most difficult things about this parable, so last week we have a very difficult to un parable to understand. So most people struggle with understanding that parable from last week. But this week's parable is a completely different situation. This parable is so easy to understand, but usually we choose not to listen. We choose not to listen to the commandment that Jesus gave. That is to care for those people who are in need. Not just care for them, recognizing them at our gates, approaching them with our relationship, uh, offering what is on our table to them, 
and establishing a new way of interaction between us and others. Let us pray. <coughs> our Lord Jesus Christ, you are our guide, and you encourage us to see what is happening, ha happening around us. You encourage us to uh, break out of our blindness, to recognize the things that are actually happening around us. May you allow us not to be blinded in this way, and we can establish the relationship with all the people around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>